So, as the title suggests, this project was all about gauge theories, and in fact not just what might traditionally be called gauge theories, but other gauge-like theories, such as general relativity. So we actually considered the Einstein-Cartan theory in the later half of the project, which is a gauge-like formulation of general relativity. And I was actually fortunate enough to get to work on a new and unsolved part of general relativity, Basically what happens when you introduce a boundary to the space-time is all sorts of thing, bad things happen. The boundary is implied to be singular and degenerate. But we actually managed to come up with what we hope is a solution to this using edge modes. So the project, first of all, consisted of learning very thoroughly what is a gauge theory. So I'll just hopefully briefly introduce you to the idea of a gauge theory. We're not going to be able to fully mathematically formulate a gauge theory as this requires a lot of differential geometry which I haven't quite covered yet. Okay so I'm not going to be able to give you the mathematical detail of what these two things are. I'm just going to either hope you might know what they are or you're just going to be able to follow without knowing. I'm going to try and make it as followable as possible. So first of all what is a gauge theory? Well Essentially all physical theories are gauge theories, and we'll see why shortly, but the terminology gauge really arises from a very literal notion of measuring or gauging something. So the simplest example of a gauge or a gauged quantity which I could think of would be temperature. So you know that we can talk about temperature in several ways. We have several temperature scales. So we can write temperatures in Kelvin or degrees Celsius and then if you're barbaric you would write in Fahrenheit. So what these two things Kelvin and Celsius are, they are gauges for temperature. So what do you do when you measure temperature? You have some thermometer and it will have some, well, mercury, nice green mercury, that then expands and it gets hot and then you can read off from your scale what the temperature is. So in this sense you are gauging the physical quantity of temperature. Now the physical physical quantity of temperature is a, an abstract notion. If I say zero degrees Celsius that doesn't mean anything apart from it's zero on the Celsius scale. If I then say, well, zero degrees Celsius, isn't that 273 degrees Kelvin? And we would, uh, we would spend a while arguing about this, but then we would both realise, well, we're just using different gauges to describe the same underlying physical quantity. So the physical quantity of temperature can be gauged using these two scales. These, there are many other possible scales we could think of. But the key point that I want you to now realise is that the, the numbers which are assigned by either of these gauges are essentially arbitrary. They could be any number as long as they're consistent with each other. So an example then, if you boil water you would agree that it boils at a certain temperature but what actually physically is this temperature? Well, we could express it as 100 using the Celsius scale or 373 point something using the Kelvin scale. And we would know or like that these are equivalent or they're talking about the same underlying physical quantity, which is the boiling point of water. So what we should now realise is that we have somewhere down here, this will be physical reality. So our physical reality is that water boils at some temperature and now we assign to physical reality a gauge. So one gauge might be Kelvin, the other gauge might be Celsius, 
And these are just two independent descriptions of the same physical reality. They're equally valid, since we can just as well measure temperature in Kelvin as we can Celsius. They don't even have to know about each other. All that needs to happen, all that we require is that they're both talking about the same physical reality. So the two different gauges which we've constructed have to agree with each other. And how do they agree with each other? Well, we make them agree or see that they agree by defining what's known as a gauge transformation. So I've drawn this ye yellow arrow representing the gauge transformation. How would we actually construct it in practice? Well, you know that we can write down the following rule. If we say that Kelvin is equal to the degrees Celsius plus 273. So this, which I've written here now, is a gauge transformation. It transforms between the Celsius gauge and the Kelvin gauge. So what we should take away from this is that physical reality is independent from observables that we can construct, like something measurable, like a, a temperature in Celsius or Kelvin. The physical reality is abstract, and then we make it concrete or give number assignments to physical quantities using a gauge. And in order for our gauge theories to then be consistent, we need a gauge transformation, which uh, essentially allows you to ask the question, what is 373 Kelvin? How is that related to the Celsius gauge? And now this is a, a key point about gauge theories, is that you first need to specify the gauge. And not only do you need the gauge, you also have to specify the transformations. So the kind of gauges I've been talking about in this example have been very literal. You can literally take out a thermometer and produce your temperature gauge. The kind of gauge theories that we're going to be considering moving forward are going to be a lot more abstract. However, the principle is going to remain the same. And this is essentially the principle of now gauge invariance, that physics has to be independent of the gauge which you choose to describe it. So that's important enough, it can have its own name. Gauge invariance. Gauge invariance essentially says that physics isn't affected by how we measure it. So of course this is desirable. We want to be able to measure something and then not have our measurement affect the thing which we're measuring. But then also we want to be able to measure things consistently using different gauges and not have, and the underlying physics should remain the same regardless of how we're essentially choosing to arbitrarily describe it. So gauge is an arbitrary assignment of concrete numbers to physical reality and then physical reality has to be gauge invariant because this assignment of the gauge was arbitrary. And to keep or with uphold gauge invariance we need gauge transformations that essentially um, so, so the gauge transformations are the realization of gauge invariance because you can have any gauge you like as long as you can appropriately transform with a gauge transformation. Okay, so that was a bit of a hand wavy description of just what we're generally trying to do when we construct gauge theories. We're taking physical reality, we construct some arbitrary kind of representation of physical reality, which is known as a gauge, and then since this was an arbitrary representation, we could construct any other gauge so long as we can appropriately and consistently transform between the two with a gauge transformation. So in gauge theories then, it's not only the gauge, the gauges or rather the gauge fields as we will see moving forward that are important. In some sense, the gauge is less important than the transformations. The gauge transformations are what allow you to talk about different gauges and Say, see that they're talking about the same thing. 
So essentially we can see that Kelvin and Celsius are talking about the same physical reality because we have this gauge transformation that's telling us they're the same thing. So that's going to be a really important perspective to have moving forward. Gauge fields themselves are kind of meaningless. What's more meaningful is gauge transformations, which tell us that gauge fields are equivalent, or in a sense, they're talking about the same physical reality. So gauge invariance is an example of a symmetry where it's actually saying that physics should be symmetric under any choice of gauge and then changes of gauge or gauge transformations should leave physics the same we don't want to affect physics when we change gauge that's an example of a symmetry or a gauge symmetry so the very essence of gauge invariance can be understood as a symmetry in that physics is symmetric under arbitrary choice of gauge. And now, if you're familiar with group theory, you should realise the connections between group theory and symmetry. They're going to become very important now when we talk about gauge theories. We're going to be able to describe gauge symmetries using Lie groups. And our gauge fields are going to be somehow kind of group, or rather... Lie algebra, which is related to the Lie group, they're going to be group valued objects which transform under a particular representation of the Lie group. So that's maybe erring into some terminology that you don't quite understand yet, but hopefully the idea is clear. We have um, some kind of gauge symmetry, so the gauge symmetry acts on these gauge fields through a representation of a Lie group. And we're going to see examples moving forward. For example, electromagnetism can be realized as a gauge theory with a gauge field, which is so-called U1 symmetric, where U1 is the one-dimensional unitary group. And we also have, so this would be an example of an abelian gauge theory, if you know what that means. Now, an example of a more complicated theory would be non-abelian Yang-Mills theory. Now, all Yang, all of the um, theories going into the standard model of particle physics are Yang-Mills theories, non-abelian Yang-Mills theories, which are essentially gauge theories using the group SU, um, whichever dimension. So, the Yang-Mills theory that describes the standard model is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. This is the gauge symmetry group of the standard model. That, that probably doesn't mean much to you, but essentially you should realise that the gauge fields of the standard model are going to be symmetric under the action of this symmetry group here. So electromagnetism is obviously an example of a Yang-Mills theory. Young-Mills theories in general are described by these non-abelian groups. And now those are the kind of particle physics gauge theories. We can also talk about relativity or general relativity as a gauge theory, where the gauge symmetry and relativity we kind of realise as being the Lorentz symmetry or the, the freedom to choose arbitrary uh, coordinates. So I'm hopefully going to do a full series on relativity and we'll talk a lot more about this. But just for now we can note or realise that we can talk about general relativity as a gauge theory. Now this is a little bit of a rough a simplification, but we can talk about a gauge theory in terms of the group SO13 uh, if you're in four dimensions. You might recognise this as the Lorentz group. This essentially gives us the gauge symmetry to choose any Lorentz frame. So we can rotate or boost to any inertial frame. That gives us our Lorentz gauge symmetry. And then we also have to respect the diffeomorphism symmetry, it's called, of general relativity, in that if we have a manifold, we can arbitrarily change our coordinates which corresponds to a diffeomorphism of the manifold. So you can realise general relativity as a gauge theory 
with this kind of a gauge symmetry group here. The details are a bit more complicated as I'll eventually talk about. But the general idea is that the gauge theory is based on being able to arbitrarily change coordinates and having the Lorentz invariance of special relativity. So the majority of the project actually focused on general relativity as a gauge theory, which when it's written in its standard language looks nothing like a gauge theory, but when we use the Einstein-Cartan formalism using the Cartan geometry, it closely resembles a gauge theory, as we'll see shortly. So that was just a really, really, really quick <laughs> summary of the gauge theories that we deal with in physics. I'm going to go into a lot more detail and probably dedicate a series to each one of these gauge theories. But hopefully for now this has given you enough of an idea of, first of all, what a gauge theory is. Essentially all physical theories are gauge theories. And hopefully you're also able to become confident with the idea of gauge invariance that physics is going to be symmetric or invariant under arbitrary choice of gauge. It, physics doesn't care what type of ruler you use, as long as you're consistent with your measurements, you can use any gauge or any measurement system to appropriately describe the physical reality.